All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're gonna continue our discussion with thermal and moisture protection. This is part two of two. Last time we talked about was damp proofing and waterproofing as far as moisture control. And we also touched on thermal considerations, meaning insulation. Um, this time what we're gonna talk about is roofing. We have some steep slope roofing uh, with shingles, installations, panels, siding, commercial roofing, flashing. And we'll touch a little on low slope roofing, even though we did cover that during the, uh, the guest lecture, but I will touch on that as well. So let's get started. So starting with this idea of roofing, uh, this is book section 7, 6, 7, 7, 7, 8, 7, 9, 7, 10, and 7, 11 in your textbooks. A lot of sections there. I'll try and do my best to summarize it all. When we say roofing, this is the first line of defense against the weather. So it's primary uh, purpose, right? Now, when we say weather, we can mean a couple different things like participation. You have rain, you have snow, all this coming down. We have to keep the water out of our building, out of our envelope. And so we need it to the roof to filter the water away. But we have other purposes too, like sun. Uh, we don't want sun to be directly on us. So a roof actually um, prevents that from happening, right? And then thermal transmission. So back to that insulation, trapping our heat in there, uh, keeping the, the heat from the sun coming down into our house, things like that. So of course our roofing will be subjected to extreme hot and cold weather. Uh, of course it's even uh, more extreme depending on the environment. And service can have a wide range of temperature swings. So that all that will affect our roofing. Some things to consider, the life, the life cycle of uh, the roof, like a slate roof will last 100 years versus an asphalt roof may only last uh, 20 years. This roof right here, if you look, it's near the end of its life. This is called a cedar shake roof. This is actually my roof on my house and we just bought this house and we knew when we bought it that this roof was at its end of the life and we had to seriously consider if we even wanted to buy the house because this roofing was, uh, it's a very expensive roof to replace. Uh, but you can see how they're peeling up and warping and splitting and things like that. So uh, considering the life cycle, code and insurance requirements. Um, so sometimes you might have a higher insurance cost if your roofing is more flammable or, or something like that. Um, building construction and location can affect your, your design, of course. Uh, we are in a coveted area, meaning that there's code on what kind of roofing we can use based on our location. Building use, of course, this is residential. A commercial building would have a different uh, type of roof or could. Budget and cost, like I said, this is a much more expensive roof, so hopefully we don't have to use the same roof when we replace it. Fire resistance, um, you have a cedar shake. It definitely isn't as fire resistant as like a, a, a slate. We have wind performance, so is the wind going to pick it up? The energy efficiency and roof drainage, how well does water drain off? So all those should be considered when picking out your type of roof. Also, another big consideration is the slope of the roof. So what is slope? Slope is rise over run. So you'll hear these things like a, a 212 slope. What that means is over a 12 inch run, we will have a rise of two inches, right? Uh, now we can break these into two different categories, either steep roofs or shallow roofs. Steep roofs are greater than one and a half inches drop over a foot and shallow roofs are less than that. There's some roofing vocabulary you should be familiar with. There's some, some here. Um, I'm not going to spend too, too much time. We'll, we'll hit on some of these like a valley or an eave on the underside or soffit, underlayment, drip edge, fascia. So you'll hear all these terms and I added this little link as well where you can see there's a number of terms here with related to, to roofing, right? So while I'm just giving you some, you could go click on this link and take a look at many, many more. So let's move on with this idea of steep slope roofing. And with steep slope, we talked about the slope of the roof. Um, now, I do want to say that the slope of the roof is a function of the material, exposure, and roofing application uh, method. So when we talk about material, we can see there's these different materials here. Uh, we'll talk more in detail about some of these, but asphalt, this would be an example. That's what you're probably most familiar seeing, most common in residential construction anyways. We have wood shakes, like I was showing you on, on my house, and these are actually wood shingles, similar. Uh, slate shingles. This is a slate shingle. I had that in my house in Virginia. And we have clay tile. 
and it can also be made out of concrete. So a number of different materials, each one of those might have a different slope requirement, right? Steeper in some cases. Um, also exposure and application methods should be con So we talked about roof slope. There's another term that you don't want to mix up and that is roof pitch. So the difference between roof slope and pitch is the fact that a slope we said like a 412 would be four inch rise over 12 inches versus a roof pitch will be the rise over two times the run. So for the exact same 412 slope, what we would call that is a 424, meaning it's four over two times that run of 12 inches. That's where we get the 424. So basically the, the easy way to remember it is if you're talking about the, the pitch, just take the denominator or the run, multiply it times two, leave your rise the same. So talking about steep roofs, we've already defined what the, what the slope is. Uh, insulation and vapor retire decking, underlayment, shingles, tile, and accessories would be the order as we move inside and out, right? So this, this picture over here doesn't really show the, uh, the uh, insulation, but we can see we have our decking on here. After our decking, we have this stuff called underlayment. So this underlayment is below our shingles. Then of course we have our shingles. And last but not least, these other accessories that we can add on. This underlayment, uh, like I said, it's between your, your wood sheeting and your shingles. So we can see that here's our wood sheeting up here. And then he's putting this uh, rhino roof down. Uh, this typically, I'm not sure about rhino roof, but most of these materials actually have a really sticky backside. So when you're placing it down, it, it, it seals up against the roof. And then in addition to that, it looks like there's some places where you can nail it down as well. Um, this is one newer style. Now the more classic is to have an asphalt felt layer where it's like um, felt paper or this asphalt paper. Uh, but what you're doing is you're providing this moisture barrier. Uh, from the sheeting. You don't want that sheeting because it is not waterproof. You need to keep it dry. This is what's doing it along with the shingles. So the shingles are your first line of defense. As the water hits the roof, the second line would be this underlayment. Uh, so with this roof laying, you can see there's, there's general requirements based on if you have a 15 or a 30, 30 being a thicker material. Uh, and you know, also based on your roofing material, so you're gonna have slate or wood or clay or concrete, you can see how many layers you need of this underlayment, as well as maybe the thickness of that underlayment, uh, things like that. So here we can see more the, the classic asphalt rolled or saturated uh, underlayment where he's tacking it down. You can see these are nails with a little collar around there, keep them from going all the way through and keep this down. This does not have a sticky backside like the other material we we're just looking at. Uh, you can also see how you do multiple layers. It really doesn't change the thickness very much. And in fact, here is a, a little diagram showing you that overlaying of this material. And in fact, if you look closely, these are 36 inches wide and we have an overlap of 19. So 36 divided by two is 18. That means there is this little place in here that would actually have three layers if I did my math right. But everything has at least two layers with that overlap, right? Some other things you could look at are uh, a starter strip, which is like a, a smaller, like a half sheet, uh, things like that. So after underlayment, we have our shingles covering up the underlayment. Of course, we're staggering our vertical joints, and what that does is it makes it harder for water to penetrate up in any particular place. Um, of course, it's a weather protection, but it's also aesthetic, and that's more and more important as we care about what their houses look like or our commercial structures. Common materials for these shingles, like I've already talked about, wood, asphalt, slate, clay, or concrete. And here we can see uh, definitely some of the aesthetics as the different af asphalt shingles come in a variety of profiles and colors, uh, green, and look at this little cool little detail there. So all sorts of different shapes and sizes. So before you put on your shingles, we've already basically ran through this, but you have your sheeting that's right on top of your, your roof trusses. Then that underlayment, that's that uh, your asphalt or some other material that's, that's sticking to that sheeting. Then we, you want to put on your eave flashing. Uh, so this is your, your flashing to try and keep water from going underneath. 
We also have drip edges. Basically, it allows water to come down and drip. Instead of being sucked into your structure, it, it deflects the water out, so it'll drip beyond the structure. Valley flashing, I see my valley over here. Vertical sidewall flashing, this one doesn't show up. We'll talk more about that. Chimney flashing, so flashing is, your, your, you know, it's usually a shinier metal type material. We'll talk more about that in just a second. Or stack flashing, stacks like your pipes that are coming out of your roof. All of that is, is all designed to keep your water away. And we've talked about flashing before, same idea here. So continuing on this idea of flashing, um, it must be impervious to moisture, of course, if we, that's the whole point of it, to keep water deflected away. Corrosion resistant, well, if it's exposed to water, can't have it eroding away. Resistant puncture, resistant to puncture and abrasion. The idea is if you have people walking on your roof or if you have uh, pine cones falling or something, it isn't gonna get worn out. Malleable to allow for ease of insulation. So how bendable and flexible is it to get around a chimney or to get in this this valley, something like that, right? We have five metal types. Uh, we have copper, lead, galvanized steel, aluminum, stainless steel. And if you look, what's the commonality behind all of those metals is that none of them are corrosive, right? When they're exposed to moisture, they aren't going to start to rust. Most metal flashes, flashing requires expansion joints every 40 feet, which makes sense because when metal heats up, it has a high coefficient of thermal expansion. It wants to grow a lot and we can't have it growing and destroying our roof. So with our flashing, we can have an open valley um, where I can see that the valley, you know, of course, is coming down like this. Open meaning that I can actually see the flashing and I'm taking my, my uh, shingles and I'm stopping it and I, the, the flashing is exposed. I think there was a picture earlier on. Yeah, so here we see some exposed flashing and more exposed flashing. Now, as opposed to that, we can have uh, woven or closed valleys. So what the way this works are these are every layer as, as we move down with our shingles will be uh, woven over the last one, right? And basically we're covering up our whole valley. We can have step flashing. Step flashing means we have these individual units. See how this is like maybe, well, it tells me here, doesn't it? Each one is seven inches wide. So if this one is seven inches, then my next one is seven inches and I have overlap and then seven inches and overlap. So as your water comes down, it can't go back uphill. Water doesn't do that. So it continues to flow down and doesn't go into your wall either. Here we have some chimney flashing and I can see it's that same stepped process. The only difference here is it's pressed up against our chimney. I see a couple different styles of this. This one's more continuous along here. Uh, when we talk about nailing down our shingles, uh, it's really important. It says the most important step in applying a steep, steep slope roofing material because if you have a nail that goes in sideways or something, you can imagine how water will pool up here and that's not good because it could eventually seep through the shingle and the underlayment. And in fact, this looks like it probably even cut a piece of the shingle, right? So same idea, you don't want it too low because you could have water pool here. You don't want it too high because you get water underneath, but you end it just right. So both flush, not too deep. And when we start our shingling process, uh, we do start with a starter strip just kind of like what we were talking about earlier with our underlayment, where it's basically like a half of a shingle. Um, and then when we do our first full course, it actually overlaps this half. And what it ends up happening as we work our way up is, is if you look at this shingle, we have half of it is going to be exposed and the other half will be covered by the shingle above. What that means is you end up with two layers of asphalt shingles at any point along your roof, right? Actually, it's a little bit more than that in some places. So the key is the overlap. Uh, some vocabulary here. We have a headlap and I can see that this this headlap is it's it's basically this distance of overlap where I'd have three layers, right? Um, I also have my top lap. So my top lap is this part that is exposed and then I have the side lap which you can't really see from this picture, but side to side, like into the page. I think the other picture, you could probably see it a little bit better. Here's our side lap. So from one tile to the next as we go up. And we also have exposure, which basically just means the, the part of the tile that's seen. So that's some vocabulary you should be familiar with. Uh, hip and ridge shingles. We talked a little bit about valleys. Uh, 
And this is the same idea, only now we're, we're, we're going the other way, like a hip or a ridge, right? Um, you can have some kind of uh, cap on the top. Uh, this has a clip for these, these caps on top with a nailing strip. It's one way you could attach it. But basically the idea is at the top, you need a constant surface so that when water hits here, it'll deflect down on either side. That's the whole idea behind those, right? Uh, on that ridge, we can actually have ridge vents. So we talked last time about how important it is to vent our attic spaces so that we keep that moisture out. This is one way to do it. As we know, heat rises. So we have ventilation coming through down below and or possibly like say uh, uh, some louvers on my gable or something. And then the air comes up and it comes out these vents. So anytime you walk around and you might see a structure that has the top cap looks like it's like extra thick, it's probably because there's a vent there. For slate and tile roofs, like I said, I had a, a slate roof in, in when I lived in Virginia. The house was 100 years old and it was the original roof. So it was actually a 100 year old slate tile up there. Um, and when I called my insurance company, they just didn't want to believe me because whoever I was talking to wasn't familiar with those roofs. And she said, well, how old is your roof? And I said, 100 years. And she said, no, that's not possible. Roofs only last about 20 or 30 years. So they had to come out and actually see it. One of the, but they, that person knew. Anyways. So slate and tile, these are heavier roofs and we have to accommodate that and we also have to figure out ways to attach it. Um, so the way we attach it is we nail to these things called battens. And we can see these battens are, is this wood structure on top of our underlayment. So we still have our sheathing, then we have our, our underlayment, then we have our battens and we can see that's what we're attaching because these are such a heavy structure we don't want it falling down. And we can either have a single or double batten. I think I have a picture coming up with a double batten. Basically, it's just another set going the other direction. Uh, we can have clay or concrete tiles as well. And these battens to promote drainage airflow because it does give you this extra uh, room for air to circulate and prevent debris from building up. Here we can see our double batten systems. So, of course, we have two layers of our battens. Uh, here's a slate roof, similar to what I had in, in Virginia. Uh, and slate, just like these other tiles, are, are these other roofing systems, of course, overlap. And you have about 50 to 60% of your tile is covered up by the next tile as you work your way up. So like I said, we already heard a little bit about low slope, actually heard a lot of it about low slope roofing from our, our guest speaker on uh, from last time. So let's move a little bit. Let's, let's go through some of this low slope uh, roofing terminology with these membranes. Uh, oh, corresponds to book section 7.8. So low slope means that it's almost flat. There has to be a little bit of a slope, so we do have some drainage. Um, and you can see it, you know, so, so some components involved. We have our decking that we're starting off with, then a thermal insulation, vapor retarder, roof membrane, a ballast, drainage, and flashing. Not necessarily in every case, but those are all things we can talk about and we will, I'll touch on those as we get through it. When we talk about our systems, we have three primary systems. First being uh, made out of an asphalt or an asphalt membrane system. And these are built up roofing systems. That means that I have multiple layers, I'm building it up. Uh, they're polymer modified bitumen systems and they're rolled out. Uh, versus a single ply membrane, because the, the built up roofing of course has multiple layers, multiple plies, versus a single ply. We have two types of uh, single ply. We have thermoplastic and thermoset. And then last, we could apply it as a liquid elastomeric membrane system. And that can either be water-based or solvent-based, right? So starting off with this built-up roofing system, like I said, it's a part, it's basically made out of an asphalt and asphalt membrane system. This is really what everyone used to use. Uh, we have multiple layers. That's the BUR, that's the built-up part. Each layer is like uh, has asphalt impregnated felt between layers of asphalt oil. Now, all that's waterproof, right? And it's basically just putting layer on top of layer to keep it all out. Uh, how do we install it? Well, we start off with these felt. We have hot asphalt or coal tar, put down the felt, and then uh, put overlapping layers, uh, creating one solid structure. Typically two to four layers or piles thick, or maybe three to four on commercial. Here's a picture of it going on with this built up roofing on site. You can see he's putting down some kind of coal tar, rolling this stuff over it. 
Uh, and then moving on to single ply. So this is, as the name implies, just a single layer. It's either a thermoset or a thermoplastic. Much simpler. Um, and what we learned from our little presentation is this thermoplastic TPO is by far the most popular right now, or at least the last 10, 15 years, because it takes less uh, manpower, it's quicker to set up, and it isn't any more expensive. But the other type of thermoplastic could be PVC. In thermosets, we have this EPDM. Installation of that single ply system, a couple different ways we can have ballasted. What ballast means is there's some weight that's holding the whole thing down, right? So that's what it says, the ballast or concrete pavers adds weight to prevent the, de the, the wind from uplift. So you might have all this pea gravel or something, something down that's holding it down, right? Uh, it says the weight should exceed at least 10 to 12 pounds per square foot. We could also, instead of having the weight, self, the self weight and the ballast on top, we could mechanically attach it somehow, right? So we have some fasteners or something that's holding it down. And of course, then we have to seal up the fasteners or have the fasteners overlaid. Uh, we could also have adhered, or then we're using adhesives or something like that to connect these membranes. This is a shot, uh, it might look a little familiar. You see some buildings in the back, it should look familiar. This is CSU campus. This is that computer science building where they are working on that flat roof up there. So when, we, when it comes to the flashing, uh, typical roof terminations is where we need our flashing, which would be at a parapet wall. If you don't know what a parapet wall is, it's like if I had a roof like this, it's a wall at the end of my roof. It's like a wall that goes around the building. Um, or at a free edge, we need to have some, uh, some flashing. Uh, for flashing performance, we have to look at the moisture penetration of the building. We always want to keep moisture out, right? Uh, typical flashing types, we could have base flashing, curb flashing, flange flashing. And we do have to watch out that the type of material is compatible with the thermal expansion of the roofing material. So what that means, if I have metal flashing, say it goes up to, against a wall and it's mechanically fastened to my roofing material, if the metal tries to grow and the roofing can't grow at the same rate as a different uh, coefficient of thermal expansion, then it'll tear itself apart, right? So we need to make sure that those those uh, rates of expansion are the same as temperature changes. Remember, there's a lot of heat being absorbed on a roof. If you've ever been on a on a black roof in the middle of summer, it's a very hot environment. So uh, this is your parapet wall. Like I said, it's like you, if you have a flat roof or low slope roof, and then you have a wall at the end of it. What we're talking about is the flashing, and the flashing is this bit right here that's keeping your water out, right? Um, so as water hits here, it's, it comes along here, drips down, hits this flashing, goes out, you can't get into the building. Even if it's blown this way, there's no way for it to penetrate up into the building. Here's curb flashing. Uh, so our curb flashing is actually this piece right there. And our curb flashing is this is a system it looks like right there and there's a little piece there it's like a two layer type of thing and of course you can imagine water coming here running down running out just to keep the water out we also have flange flashing at the top of a gravel stop so we're talking about this flashing up here to keep once again the water out so we have these preformed pipe flashing, a pipe. Anytime you have a pipe coming out of your roof, of course, we have to make that watertight. So we have it sealed up top and then water could run down our flashing. These are these bright metal things you see sticking out of roofs most commonly. And it has to be sealed on the bottom as well. And from the computer science buildings, you can see a little flashing. This is curb flashing to keep the water out here. Uh, flange flashing for drains on the computer science building. So, uh, we're talking right around here. That part is all sealed up. Looks like they have a rubber gasket on there too as well. Curb flashing needed at all steel roof penetrations. So when you have a structure that's going through the roof, of course I need to flash that to keep the water from going into the structure. Uh, single ply EPDM through the wall scrubber. We haven't talked about wall scrubbers, but it's basically this little area through the parapet wall um, where water would actually drain. So it, it all slopes this way and then comes out right there. So let's move and change topics a little bit and talk about siding and the side of the house, right? Uh, when we talk about uh, siding, it can be many different types. We can have shingles, aluminum, tiles, vinyl, wood, plywood, or hardboard. 
So with shingles, you could have wood or cement shakes. What does that look like? What you see in the side of the house is something like this. I always think like East Coast, like New England, you see a lot of things like this, usually with the wood ones. Uh, cement, there were a lot of issues if you had a house in the, in the 40s or 50s, made in the 40s or 50s. This, the, a lot of times this will have asbestos in it. So they used to do asbestos shingles. Uh, if you don't know about asbestos, it's great for being a fire retardant. So these asbestos shingles were used to keep fire out. However, they do cause a little bit of cancer. So um, they have kind of gone by and by. We have aluminum. So aluminum siding usually comes in a big sheet. Uh, you know, this, this could be aluminum here. Can't really tell from this picture, but that's what you're seeing when you see these uh, little ridges in the side of your siding. Uh, but aluminum is lightweight, has low maintenance, so it's it's very popular. Uh, however, it has somewhat of a high cost. Uh, tiles can be cement, lightweight cement, or even slate. Vinyl, we have our polyvinyl chloride, or PVC. Um, it looks just like the aluminum. I think that's probably a, a vinyl siding. We could have wood, and you could think of it could look just like this, and they're lapped on top of one another. It could also be vertical, like shiplap. Um, you could do plywood with a fir or cedar, uh, not usually the most attractive thing, but if it's a temporary structure or something and hardboard, uh, it's usually like a, well, it's a dense material that it, they make it look architecturally like it looks like wood, but it's, uh, it looks like uh, planks of wood, but usually it's just one solid sheet or like a board. Some characteristics between aluminum and vinyl. So like I said, that's, they both look the same once on the structure. You may not even know unless you really go up and feel it. What's some difference? Well, some aluminum needs to be uh, vented in some way. Uh, it does conduct electricity, um, and it's generally resistant to the effect of intense sunlight, snow, hail, sleet, ice spray. Vinyl, made from that PVC, like I said, it's a thermoplastic, can be formed in different ways. Don't put your barbecue grill too close to it. I did that one time, melted my vinyl siding, wasn't good. Uh, it is flexible, has a high impact resistance where aluminum would actually dent if I hit it with a baseball or something. Uh, but it does not provide a weatherproof barrier, so we need some kind of barrier beneath the siding. So usually you have, um, usually you have it on any type of siding anyways, but you have to make sure on the vinyl you have a protective coating or protective sheet material on the underside or the backside. Some, uh, some roof specialties and accessories, we have expansion joint covers. Uh, we talked about how you can have uh, you can have different expansion of your roof materials. You might want to have a cover. So basically two parts. If this was like, say, I don't know, say a roof vent or something, you might have these two are going to expand back and forth. So you'd have a gap in here. Well, you can't have water in here. So this would be your expansion joint cover covering it. So then when water does penetrate, it will not get into that joint, right? Gravel stops and fa fascias usually perform from sheet metal or an extrusion process. Basically, we talked a little bit about the flashing. This is, this is the same type of idea. Scrubbers, we showed a picture of a scrubber earlier, that drain outlet through the parapet wall, right? We talked about how water is sloped to that parapet wall. It has to get out, so it's going to go through a scrubber. And then sometimes it'll be uh, routed into a pipe from there. Gutters, uh, I don't know, you have a roof and your water's coming down so you gotta collect it. So here you have a structure that, uh, there's my, my gutter on the side of my house, right? Um, I think most of our are used to gutters, maybe not. Now you could have an internal gutter system, basically it's just you can't see it, it's inside the building. There are, that is the case in Guggenheim, so you can go out and see if you can find that. Downspouts, so basically if you have a gutter, you need to get rid of all that water. So you have a downspout here, leading it in and out away from your structure. Um, specialties like ridge vents, we talked about those, curves, gravity ventilators, skylights, heat and smoke vents, roof hatches, a lot of different accessories we can put on the, the roof. Now, that was all in order, so after we get our roof uh, shingles uh, applied. Other types of protections, we do have fireproofing. Uh, we need to eliminate or control the fire, right? Uh, so we can put down these fire retardant products. Fire, we can have encasement, plaster, gypsum, mineral fiberboard, spray applied fireproofing, where you spray on something and it coats it. Intumescent coating, ceilings, flame shields, through penetration, fireproofing, just a lot of different fireproofing junk. Joint protection. So to seal these joints, uh, some kind of uh, caulking or something to seal out the water. And we need this watertight seal. It has to be 
Elastometric has to be flexible, right? Solvent release, curing agents, uh, latex emulsion, tape sealants, acoustical sealants, preformed foam sealants, oil-based caulking compounds. A lot of different ways that they look almost the same, but if you were to get in, in the caulking aisle and look at the different caulks and read what is actually in there, you might have uh, an oil-based versus a latex versus 100% silicone or something like that, right? So that's what I have as usual. I hope you found it informative and let me know if you have any questions or comments. Thanks.